Well, we uh, last time we were together, we talked about um, about Samuel growing up in safety in Shiloh and learning his role as a young prophet. Eli continued to function as the high priest and using Samuel's ability to hear the voice of God, he functioned as a judge. The little boy was not required to do that. Um, and that is confirmed in the, in the text. So, The Ark of the Covenant, not the other Ark. Ark is simply a word that means container. <laughs> so if you look at the map here, um, Joppa up here and Ash, Ashad and Ashkelon, Gath and Ekron were all towns that the Philistines had established. The Philistines were a seafaring people, possibly very early Greek, possibly, who colonized uh, the coastal cities and, um, and the plains uh, near them. And they just took land that, that, the, uh, that the Hebrew people claimed, but apparently could not hold. So the Philistines were almost constantly at war um, with Israel, trying to push the boundaries of their colony further into Israel. And the Philistines, more often than not, defeated the Israelites in battles. In this story, the Israelites had lost 4,000 men. That's how it's translated, though um, it may only have been 50, depending on how <laughs> one translates one word. <laughs> and thus, the commanders of the Israel army decided to carry the Ark of the Covenant into the battlefield, and they hoped that God traveling with the Ark would terrify the enemy and lend aid to the Israelites for a win. There was a problem with that, though. God was thought to sit on a th an invisible throne made up of cherubim. He's actually sitting on the cherubim, and then he would place his feet on the ark as a footstool in the tent of meeting or what is called the tabernacle. So topic one is, is it a good idea to presume that you could just take the ark away and God will follow? I mean, um, this is what they did. Um, it was probably I not why. Not having another and I don't know, if you were sitting with an enthroned gall, a god and you took away his footstool, I think you would just make him angry. <laughs> now, the reason they thought it was a footstool is that uh, all the kings in that era had such a footstool. And in that footstool were the scrolls confirming their alliances with other kingdoms. Um, and... Uh, so they assume God would do the same thing that uh, human beings did. But if you're thinking in that kind of literalistic terms, um, it's just, you know, not a good idea. So you, you assume that God's going to be on your side and you assume that God will follow and you assume that God's going to win the war for you. Um, and that's a lot of presumption. And yet I think we do the same thing. Can anyone think of an example where we presume God is going to ally with our politics and do what we want? No. I've been reading The Color of Compromise uh, with a group from the church, and uh, it's quite clear that, that churches shaped God to um, support slavery. Um, <laughs> so, and I don't think God did, of course, but, um, we just used certain Bible verses and created a mythology that, that, uh, denigrated fellow human beings. 
Yeah, we sure, um, we used it as far as um, as LGBT uh, against LGBTQ people. Against, mm -hmm. No, or in many denominations. Yes. You know, against abortion, against um, uh, white uh, anybody who's not white. Against women, which I think is hysterical, because there wasn't any white people in the Bible. <laughs> no, <laughs> but I think it's common for um, groups to find the parts of the Bible that align with whatever their basic belief is, and right. take that as the right. God-given truth. And it's right here in the Bible; it says this. Right. And so that's what I want to do, and I can justify it this way called proof texting yes um, mm -hmm. but we also use our symbols also i think um our crosses etc um in ways that i think god would prefer we didn't <laughs> okay we got hophni and phineas uh eli's sons as priests designated to carry the ark now, hopefully, and Phineas are not good priests. They've been robbing um, the offerings that people brought to uh, to the to Shiloh and the shrine for God, and um, either eating them themselves or selling them on the side. So they are not good people. Um, but they are priests, and in general, regular human beings don't even try to go near the ark it was supposed to be carried by levites only um, and so they're they're doing it the ark put fear into the hearts of the philistines on seeing the ark the philistine soldiers remembered the stories of how the god of israel had saved the people and uh, from pharaoh the, that's the philistines remembering and conquered and how they conquered jericho so um kind of interesting that the Philistines would even know those stories. However, the Philistines were more numerous and better armed. They had more metal helmets and breastplates and more spear, uh, metal spearheads and arrows and arrowheads. And in addition, they owned more chariots with metal rimmed wheels which gave them a huge advantage when fighting on the flat and, uh, and land of the plains. The people of Israel may have been fighting on foot with spearheads and arrowheads made of flint and boiled leather, leather breastplates and helmets. Only the high ranking officers would have been able to afford metal weapons and armor. One of the reasons the Philistines kept invading was that Israel, because of their armaments, looked so ready for the taking. In the end, the Philistines, though frightened, did win the battle. And during the battle, Hophni and Phinehas were killed and the Ark was captured. You'll notice the Philistines are wearing this headdress um, in the pictures, and you'll see other pictures of it. Uh, it was to make them look taller as soldiers, to make them look more formidable, uh, especially when you're fighting hand to hand. Um, a man from the tribe of Benjamin ran from the battle line to bring the news to Eli, who was anxious, waiting to hear that the Ark and his sons were safe. Now, Eli was 98 years old and his eyes stared blankly because he could no longer see. He asked the, uh, the messenger for his news. He'd actually been waiting at the gate. Um, the gate is a building and it's a place where you gather, but it's also the place that news would come through very quickly. The messenger said that there had been a great loss of troops as Israel lost the battle. Hophni and Phinehas had been slain. Eli knew that the prophecy of the man of God, which was last week's lesson, had been fulfilled. Both his sons died 
on the same day. That was the prophecy that it would happen that way. It was the news that the Ark had been captured that caused Eli to crumble. He fell backward onto the stone floor. He broke his neck from that fall and died. He had been the judge of Israel for 40 years. It's interesting in the, I think in Joshua, they'll, they'll break it up to 38 years or whatever. But in Samuel, it's all rounded up to 40 or 20 or whatever. So. When Phineas' pregnant wife heard the news of her husband's death, she went into labor. She lived only long enough after the birth to name her son Ichabod. Ichabod means the glory of God, that's kabod in, um, in Hebrew, has departed, which is the ik part. Um, and she, she commemorated the loss of the ark and presumably the loss of God's presence with it in the name that she gave her son. But it was helpful to me when I found that out because at last I understood how funny the name Ichabod was for Ichabod Crane in Sleepy Hollow. <laughs> Who could name their son, the glory of God has departed? <laughs> I guess taking one look at him, you might do that, but Scholars believe that the story of the Ark was a separate narrative that editors incorporated into the book of Samuel. Samuel is not mentioned in this part of the book. Ancient editors, they believe, shaped the story of the boy Samuel's righteous development to contrast with Phineas and Hophni's lack of religiousness or righteousness. The counterpoint then smoothed the transition for this separate manuscript to be inserted into the book of, of uh, Samuel. Scholars also believe that the insertion of the text into Samuel's book was done in Babylon, where the audience for their work would have been the people of Judah exiled after the loss of the ark and the raising of the temple and the city of Jerusalem. Would that audience have found any hope in this story thus far? We're going to try to listen to what follows with that audience in mind. So would you have found any hope in this story so far? Or any lesson perhaps as to what you don't do or? What do you think? Well, you can't count on God to fight for you. No. <laughs> don't mess guarantee not approve. Well, that's just one take. Yeah. Yeah, don't mess with the Philistines. That might be the other, or don't mess with uh, uh, the Babylonians either. Mm -hmm. I think they might have found a connection here, but probably not much hope yet. Might now the Philistine, excuse me? Might have been kind of a warning. Um, yes. And, and a promise that if you are true to God, God will be true to you, because Samuel's I mean, it gives a little bit more context to Samuel. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So now the Philistines took the ark into the temple they had built for Dagon and set it in front of that idol. Dagon was their main god, a god of the sea, part fish and part man. Maybe an early Neptune, maybe not. If they're not Greek, it, would, it, would, it wouldn't have been. But this is about the same time, this story takes place at about the same time that theoretically the story of Troy, uh, the battle at Troy. Mm. So, okay. 
In the morning, the statue of Dagon had fallen on its face. So the Philistine priest set the idol upright, prayed heartily to Dagon for forgiveness and left. Look at the, the way the priests are dressed. That's kind of fun. Like miniature Dagons. Yeah. <laughs> and when they entered the sanctuary the next morning, the statue had not only fallen, but the head and hands had broken off, and the hands rested on the threshold, as though Dagon was trying to crawl away from Israel's God in some kind of fight. Only Dagon's trunk remained whole. And that day the people of Ashad began growing tumors, and they blamed these on the God of Israel and sent the ark away to Gath. This is a, a tumor that is caused by the bubonic plague. They're called bubo. Uh -huh. And um, so maybe this is what they were experiencing. In panic, Gath followed <clears throat> in panic, uh, <clears throat> panic in Gath followed the outbreak of tumors there also. So they sent the ark to Ekron, which is kind of strange. I mean, if you think the ark's causing a plague, why send it to a neighboring town that's of your own people? <laughs> so, don't you love the way... Um, Legos can do tumors. <laughs> <laughs> Ekron would not keep the ark because the plague of tumors um, immediately started up there as well. In addition, according to Mesorotic and uh, the Mesorotic texts were the texts that uh, are about a thousand years old and they were the ones that the Jews lent um, the people who translated the King James Bible. They were the most accurate texts available at that time. Um, and then the Dead Sea Scrolls gave us texts that were much older. Um, and that is why it's been necessary to kind of um, move from King James to um, more modern translations because they had accurate, more accurate texts to work with. Um, anyway, in the Masoretic, uh, Masoretic text and the Septuagint, the Septuagint is a text of the Old Testament translated into Greek. It had been done around Jesus's time. And um, it, it, Septu means 70 because there were 70 translators involved. Mm -hmm. And both of these texts have references to mice um, or rats. Uh, invading the city and um, and the rest of the texts don't and yet what we do have later on is a reference to the the rats and I'll show you what it is so apparently um, the story makes more sense if you use these texts so Ek Ekron Elkron was also run overrun by rats. So if we're thinking bubonic plague, then the rats would be, um, would make sense because they carried the, the plague in their bloodstream and the fleas transported it to human beings. Um, anyway, the Philistines, so you can read the text, the one you would have in the RSV does not have a reference to rats and yet, they do sell you that they made golden rats. The Philistine decided to seek forgiveness by making a guilt offering of gold in the shape of mice or, or rats and tumors to give to God's, to Israel's God. So um, I have no idea who actually made that, <laughs> but it was available. Uh, and it might've been just to make this illustration. I don't know. But they put, um, they made the shape of the tumor and the, the rat and, and decided to give it back to Israel's God. And they put it, the ark and the offering of gold 
back into the, a brand new, um, in the back of a brand new cart. And they separated a pair of milk cows from their calves and yoked them to the cart and let the cart go wherever the cows would. Some Philistines followed the cart, hoping that the cows would pull the cart away from Israel, and then they would know that the tumors were not from the God of Israel, and they could retrieve the gold. <laughs> so they followed the cart to try to figure out um, if their diagnosis of their problem was correct. The milk cows were, uh, would, have, um, would never have pulled a cart before, and um, given a choice, would probably have headed back to their calves. So if the card headed for Israel, then the Philistines would know that God, the God of Israel did inflict the tumors on them. And they then would, could only hope that the gold would buy forgiveness from this foreign God. The cows plotted straight down the road to the nearest Israelite town which if you'll see on the map is Beth Shamus. Um, and so they're coming from Elkron to here. And, and um, the Bible says that they did not veer to the right or to the left. They went directly there. So they've got their answer and they're going to have to spend that gold. <laughs> Farmers from Beth Shamus were in the field harvesting wheat when they looked up and saw the ark and they started to rejoice. On a large rock, the people of Shamus sacrificed the cows and burnt them to God using the wood from the cart. And then they sent for help from the nearest shrine to the, to the Lord at Kiriath, Jerim. This, by the way, is just written recently dug up. It's a, an altar excavated by archaeologists in a temple uh, to God in Beth Shavish. So. so what would this story say about God to the people of Judah held captive in Babylon? Would it offer hope? Well, well, they got the ark back. Yeah, they got the ark back. God was more powerful than their God. I mean, than the, than the, um, yeah, than Dagon. The enemy's God, you know. Yeah. So that would bring hope. Mm -hmm. And the fact that it got taken back to the um, Israelites might have brought them hope that maybe one day they would return. Yeah. Did it require an army to get that cart, that ark back? Did they have to? I mean, no. <laughs> no, God's perfectly capable of handling things himself or herself. Um, took an army of rats. <laughs> So, um, okay, name the many ways the Philistines showed greater respect for God than the Israelites. <clears throat> I would think when the cart went, you know, went back um, uh, with the two cows, you know, they took it back to where it belonged. I would start believing, <laughs> you know. <and> the <laughs> Whoa. Yeah. This little Dagon guy isn't doing too well. <laughs> yeah, I think that would be rather, rather shocking. Um, the other thing was that even out on the battlefield, they recognized the power of God, you know, before the battle even started. They, they already knew the stories about this God. Um, 
which is odd, but they seem to know them. And the people who assumed that they could just bring the ark out and God would come didn't seem to quite catch the connection between God and the ark and their use of it. So um, those are the two major ways. I read somebody who said, you know, they actually followed the ark, which uh, might have been out of, out of uh, curiosity, but it probably was more out of greed. So I, I don't know that I agree with this person but they anyway but they did um they did you know try to bribe god they they didn't take that god for granted no whereas it sounds like the israelites had come to a place where they kind of thought they could control where god should show up and where god shouldn't show up and and uh you know the fact that there were two rather unsavory priests in charge of carrying um the the ark into the battle um, wasn't showing a great deal of respect either. I, I was interested in their choice of two uh, milk cows to take this ark back. Um, did they not want to, to, to lose their good uh, cart carrying uh, animals or, um, you know, they had the calves so they didn't need the cows or you know what 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 was the point of that i wonder yeah it would seem less valuable um than than say an oxen or you know a trained yeah it also was a test i guess you know because uh, you know when you separate a calf from its uh, from its mother both the mother and the calf are de terribly distressed um, so yeah All right. Men came to their aid and brought the ark to the house of Abinanab on a hill in Kiriath Jerim. And they consecrated Eleazar, Abinanab's son, to be the caretaker of the ark. And that is where the ark stayed until David moved it to Jerusalem several years later. So you can see on the map where they actually ended up with it. And we'll, someday we'll get to the other ark story there. So Samuel stepped officially into the leadership as a judge of Israel after Eli's death. His first order to the Israelites was to put away all the idols to Baal and Astarte. Um, and they destroyed them. And they served the Lord, only the Lord, during Samuel's rule. Now, that is very Deuteronomist, Deuteronomistic. <laughs> um, there's always the issue of Baal. Astarte was the female uh, god um, that would be his, um, his mate, uh, Baal's mate. Um, and the fact that they destroyed them is not, well, it happened during the first, during the time of Josiah when the Deuteronomistic folks sort of appeared. Um, that they destroyed them all is hard to believe um, because they kept showing up again. Um, I don't know. Anyway, this is very Deuteronomistic. So Samuel gathered the tribes at Mizpah to offer for a sacrifice to ask God for forgiveness for mm -hmm. worshiping at other altars and for God's protection from the Philistines. So he gets all the tribes to come together under, you know, he is now the new judge. So it's time to sort of organize your people and get them sort of into shape and use to your authority. And um, so he gathers them at Mitzvah. When the Philistines heard about the gathering, they planned an attack on Samuel, the new judge. It would be good to kind of weaken him right off at the, at the start so they could continue um, acquiring land. And when the Philistines, so, so they came. However, the Lord 
thundered with a mighty voice that day against the Philistines and threw them into a panic and confusion. So here's God doing the kind of fighting that they had hoped God would do when they took the ark into the field. God is doing God's thing. I, it's interesting that this painting shows that the, the head piece on the Philistines was made of metal. It would not be a good thing to wear in an electric storm, it seems yeah. to me. I don't think that they were made of metal. I think they were, they were made of feathers, but um, anyway. So God won the battle in the way that people would expect God to win the battle. Um, but it has to be God's idea. Um, and it was. As the Philippines, or Philippines, as the Philistines ran from Mitzvah, the Israelites pursued them as far as Beth Car and struck many of them down. So, Samuel no longer tried, tied, no longer tied to, to Shiloh because the tabernacle had been moved to Abinamab's property. <clears throat> Travel in a circuit from Bethel to Mitzvah to Gilgal, and Gilgal is way over here, um, and finally to Ramah, his hometown. And at each stop, he settled the most difficult disputes and civil suits and criminal cases for the tribes. That's what a judge did. Um, but he also uh, would call armies together. In Ramah, he built an altar to the Lord. Samuel called on tribes of soldiers for the defense of the nation as needed and administered justice in Israel all his days. So that's the story for the day. The next part of the story is, um, is the tribes coming together and asking Samuel to uh, help them create a king. Um, and the reason is that um, they can't respond fast enough to the lightning kind of blitzkrieg attacks that the Philistines are um, imposing on the borders um, because uh, they have to gather the tribes and find a leader and then go. And what they want is a king with a standing army um, who can respond within hours uh, to any attack, any incursions. Um, and Samuel can't do that. Um, so that becomes the issue um, that he has to deal with. And eventually um, he chooses uh, to anoint a king because God helps him get over a, a big, <laughs> he's really mad about that. Um, so um, anyway, so that's the story. How many of you had heard that story before? I had not. I probably had, but I didn't remember it. It isn't one that I think, you know, most of us know the stories uh, of, would know these stories from our childhood. The most um, kind of Bible education I got in Sunday school was during um, vacation Bible school, that you'd get a, a set of stories one after another. Um, David was one that was popular to, to tell the, the cycle of David's life in a week. But there are, this story doesn't uh, show up very often in uh, 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 curriculums for Sunday school. Um, it may be, I don't know, it's, it may not appeal. Um, rats. Out of war. Because the rats. The rats. <laughs> the plague. <laughs> You don't, yeah. you know, when I, I would teach these things at St. Anne's and I would think, you know, no other teacher is allowed to teach 
this kind of stuff to this age of kid. Um, but I was, <laughs> and it wasn't <laughs> that they didn't, it wasn't that they didn't get it, it, but I did have to watch uh, very carefully, you know, how violent uh, I made it. Um, um, you know, the Legos, the Legos tumors were a lot easier to handle, say, than, than what the bubonic plague would really have done. Um, so I don't know. Um, but many people don't know this story, and that's just a shame because it's it's good in a way. How do you think um, if you were in sitting around in Babylon waiting to be released? It took fifty five years, um, but ready to be released to go home. Um, how would this story have affected you? A bit scared to go home. A little <laughs> negative, yeah. With the gods of Babylon. <laughs> yeah, so that would be where, one. When they were in Babylon, where was the ark? Or had had, had it been destroyed? The ark had, or? Disappeared. The had, ark disappeared. had disappeared. Okay. So they didn't have access to it anymore. Um, so, then, so then, in a way, perhaps it it would have given them some comfort that God was still present, even if the ark was not still working. Could uh huh. You know, you were not uh, the the enslavement, if you will, in Babylon was not anything like it that had happened in Egypt. Uh, what they did was to collect um, all the people who um, could read and all the people who had uh, skills that could be used in Babylon, so artisans. But if you were just a dirt farmer, they didn't have much interest in you. And if you hid, they didn't kill you. So you could stay in your own country. But the people who went to Babylon um, could read, or at least the men could, um, or they were, they were carpenters or uh, stonemasons or uh, people that could help build that great capital. But they were given housing. Um, they were allowed to earn money. Um, they could, uh, they actually opened banks. Um, and when the time came to leave, most did not. Um, and there was a community of Jews in Babylon uh, up to at least 300 AD and even now um, in that area. But um, the community of Jews in Babylon um, contributed to uh, the Talmud. They actually helped to assemble it. There was another team assembling it in Jerusalem at the time, but Jerusalem got overrun again. And uh, so they were the ones who, got, who actually published it. Um, people like, um, I'm trying to think of the, Oh, almost came to me, uh, but the the there was a uh, a famous Hillel. Hillel came from Babylon and went to Jerusalem to study to become a a, a rabbi. Um, and he was a poor man in uh, in that he was a just a day laborer almost. Um, he just wanted to learn and. Uh, he came from Babylon. So the community in Babylon was strong. Um, and it was the community in Babylon that invented um, or put together a way to worship from um, without a temple. They invented um, synagogue 
or polished synagogue worship. Uh, the Pharisees had started it, but um, they put it together and more or less created the form. So anyway. I have a question then about um, at universities, there's um, a Hillel house. Mm -hmm. the, in Jesus's time, there were two major um, shulas or uh, places to, what do you call that? Um, anyway, that where you would develop a rabbi. And um, one of them um, was run by Hillel and the other was run by um, a fairly uh, uptight, I suppose, uh, rabbi. But Hillel um, should never have become a rabbi. Only, only wealthy families could afford to send um, a child to rabbinic school like that. Um, and he had come uh, married um, with a couple of kids and a trade um, or day labor or whatever. He had come to from Babylon to, to Jerusalem and there's stories about him, but one was that he couldn't afford, you had to pay to go into class every day and he couldn't afford it. So he'd climbed onto the roof of the school where there was an opening for, um, for the fire that was in the center of a, a round domed room. And he was up on top of the dome uh, where the smoke was coming out, trying to listen to the lesson that he couldn't afford to pay for by going in the door. And um, it started to snow and they were aware in the, in the, um, in the room uh, that someone was on the roof because apparently it was, you know, translucent or something and they could see the shadow and uh, they went up and he was quite nearly frozen um, and they brought him down to the brazier and asked him what he was doing and because he had done that they for the first time created a scholarship to allow somebody who was not wealthy to study there <laughs> and uh, that's the story it's it's probably legend but the, the result was that um, he became the, the leader ultimately of that particular rabbinic school. And um, he of course created scholarships for everybody. Um, anybody, you know, anybody that could do the work and wanted to study. Um, whereas the other school continued to be um, elitist. Um, Anyway, thank you. <laughs> totally off. This time in exile in, in many ways resembles the time we are going through right now. Okay. In that... Well, we can, we can look at a picture of the chapel when... when but it's just a picture of the chapel and, you know, it, we can't have communion in the normal way because we can't be physical. I mean, so there are some, we're exiled. Yes. Yeah. And where do we get our hope from our religion in this exile? Other people have survived it. We can too. <laughs> And there will be a vaccine soon, and that you can yeah. say, well, maybe God's help to the uh, scientists who are working on it. Mm -hmm. He is working through it that way. Mm -hmm. It was, I think, a, quite a surprise to the to the ones who who many of them had learned to read in the temple. Uh, with the, with the priests, and to be able to conduct religion in um, maybe the comparison between synagogue worship and maybe our morning prayer, um, I've been very surprised by morning prayer and how how it feeds me. I didn't think it would be possible. Um, so, and by the way. <laughs> 
it's based, our morning prayer is based on, um, on the uh, book of prayer that Jews used. Um, much of it is, is directly from that. So, good to know. Anyway, well, that's way off. <laughs> <laughs> but if you're going to talk about Samuel, you need to talk about the two eras in which it probably came into being um, or came to its final, final <laughs> form. And um, Babylon is that one of those eras. Well, I talk too much. No. Um, <laughs> no. We, we no. like hearing you, Mary. We like hearing you. <laughs> well, I speak for myself, but I think Deborah agrees. It, it has been a very interesting lesson. I have mm -hmm. been like hearing it. Good. And now I need to go rake up leaves before the wind blows. I know, I, I'm looking forward to getting on a ladder and checking out the gutters this afternoon. So. Um. <laughs> be careful. Yes. We all take care and we'll see you another day. Yes. Okay. So it's gonna be an introduction to Saul next time. Which is a cute reaction. Um, that sounds good. Thank you, Mary. Thank, Thank you, right. you, Mary. Bye -bye. Have a good week. Thank you, Mary.